In this video, I wanna show you how to make beautiful mathematical graphics and diagrams using LaTeX. If you have no idea what LaTeX is, this is a mathematical typesetting language that allows you to make beautiful mathematical documents. This is actually my fifth video in my series on LaTeX, so I have a whole bunch of previous videos that talk about all sorts of other parts to make these beautiful mathematical documents. But in this video, we're gonna focus on one specific package called Tixi. Now, before I jump into it, I should say that whenever you're working with LaTeX, working with this code to be able to make these mathematical documents, you should have a wonderful LaTeX editor. And I'm very proud that this series on LaTeX is sponsored by Overleaf. Overleaf is an online cloud-based LaTeX editor. And the main reason I really like Overleaf, why I've used it for years and recommended it to my students long before I was ever sponsored for these videos, is because it has so many quality of life little enhancements that make this somewhat cumbersome process of learning and using LaTeX just a lot easier. Things like having history and being able to track changes and make comments as you're collaborating on a document. And, and we'll see a bunch of these little things as we go along. Okay, enough about Overleaf, let's get to the video. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come up, I'm gonna click a new project. I'm gonna do a blank project and let's say Tixi YouTube. This is gonna be the name of my project. The way this works is on the left, I'm gonna put the code and on the right, I'm gonna put the output. And actually the very first thing I'm gonna do is gonna come up to the share button because I actually want you to be able to follow along the exact same document. And so I am going to share this link. That link will be down in the description. It's just a really nice feature of Overleaf. Now I don't actually need a title page so I will get rid of this. And this little bit of code is what we begin with in a, in a so-called blank document. Now. I want to use Tixi, so I'm going to add this package, use package, and I'm going to add Tixi, and I'm actually going to add one more, it's going to be called PGF Plots. These are two different packages that we're going to use in tandem a little bit for this video. There's one other thing that I'm going to add in this preamble before I get going. I'm going to say use Tix library, and then I'm going to add something called positioning. And Basically, there's a whole bunch of different extra libraries that you can add that give ever expanded functionality on the core Tix package. And I'm only use one of those, but there's many of them that you can use. That is now my preamble. Okay, so let's actually get going here. I'm going to uh, change the title of my section to Tixie, and now I'm going to do my very first thing. So. If I want to make just a single graphic that's only got one item to it, I can start it by writing backslash Tixi. And in this case, I want to draw, how about some lines? So I'm gonna go backslash draw, and, and draw lets me draw many different things, and I'm specifically gonna, how about I do this? I'm gonna do a line that starts at zero, zero, goes over to, I don't know, the point two, one, and then goes over to, I don't know, how about the point three, two, something like that semicolon at the end, and I'm gonna come and click the recompile button to visualize what it is that I get. And this is what I have. It is a pair of line segments connected, one from zero, zero to two, one, and another one from two, one to three, two. I could add as many of these as I so wished with these little double dashes to indicate that I wanna create a line, and I can just create as many lines as I so choose. Okay, now I wanna to jump to circles, but there are actually multiple types of circles. So instead what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go backslash begin and I'm gonna write Tixi picture. And notice that what happens here with Overleaf, it pops this little sort of button here, it recognizes what I'm saying. So if I just hit enter, it'll actually come and nicely format the begin and the end text picture. It just saves me a little bit of uh, typing. It's kind of like a little predictive pop-up. Okay, so I want to do the same kind of thing here. I'm gonna draw. And the way it works is initially I put in the coordinates of the origin here. So I've gone and put in zero, zero to say that it's gonna start at zero, zero. And then I write that it's a circle. This is in contrast to previously I'd written this double dash here. Now I'm gonna write circle to indicate that it's a circle. And then I need to put in the radius of the circle. And I have a few options for doing this. If I just write in, for example, one, let's just see what happens if I do this. This is gonna make a circle of radius one. But what, what does one mean? Basically, there is a default uh, distance scale that's gonna here. We'll see how to change it in the beginning, but, but right now, we'll have a radius of one corresponding to, I, I believe, to one centimeter here. And nevertheless, we get this nice little circle. In contrast, let's do, oh, I don't know, maybe I'll start it at two zero so it starts at the right. In contrast, let's do this radius as maybe 1.5, but let's write it in terms of inches. 
and we can recompile and see what that does. This now is a very big circle, so it starts to zero, so off to the right here, and 1.5 inches for the radius is a relatively large number, it makes this big circle. So you might like to use one or the other. I could also draw, let's do it over, how about like at five zero. This time I'm going to do an ellipse. Oh, I have to spell ellipse correctly, it, it lets me know I forgot the extra L. And an ellipse has two different radii, a major and a minor. And this one, maybe I had previously done it in terms of just no numbers and then inches. But this one, how about I do 10 point and 20 point, something like this. Where this is the, the same sort of size that you imagine when you're thinking about like a font size. And so nevertheless, it gives me this nice little ellipse over here. Notice it says that I have an error here. I can hover over it. It says, did you forget a semicolon? Yes, I did forget a semicolon. So Overleaf is, is really nice at being able to manage your errors and, and figure out what it is that you've done wrong. So that's line, circle, ellipses. Uh, how about we do a new one? I'm going to do a new begin Tixie picture and just quick hit the enter to, to auto-complete that. I am going to draw now a rectangle. And rectangles are kind of funny. Okay, so I'll start at 0, 0, which is one corner. I'll then click rectangle and I can come out to some other corner, 5, 4. These are like the two different opposing corners of it. Something of this nature. And it's going to make me a very nice rectangle going from 0, 0 up to 5, 4. If I didn't want it squishing, I could come in between these two things and make, say, something like V space 1 inch. And that would give me a, a sort of a forced input of one inch of space between these and get this nice little separation. Final primitive that I'll show you here is, okay, I've got a, uh, a rectangle that goes from 0, 0 to 5, 4. But you can also do something called a grid. And in this case, the grid is going to fill in that rectangle. Let's see what happens when I compile it. It fills it in with a spacing of 1. And I'll be able to adjust that spacing, and I'll show you how to do all these kind of adjustments of color and style and spacing and all these different things in a moment. But the point is, a grid fills it in, and, and this is just really useful as you can imagine if you're trying to, you know, draw a graph of something, you want some, some nice grid on the background. Okay, so what I've shown you thus far is a lot of the sort of basic primitive uh, objects that have been created, like lines and circles and grids and rectangles. But normally you don't want them to all look the same and all look black and white. Uh, you might want to have color and style and all sorts of other things. So I want to show you how you can modify these basic primitives. So to help me do this, I've copy and pasted some code that I've actually had to use in a presentation I've done previously. I'm going to select it all and do control slash to remove the commenting from it. So this is the image that we have, a little fancy what we've seen before. And I want to walk through the code to be able to make it. Now the first thing you'll notice is that the begin Tixie picture and the end Tixie picture are wrapped in begin center and end center. And I often do this with my graphics to have them centered. We've seen this kind of idea previously in the series, so I've put this in the center. The second thing I've done here is in the begin Tixie picture, I've added a parameter where I transformed the canvas and scaled it by a multiplication factor of four. So basically, we had previously seen a scaling where, you know, the, the, the value of 1 was a certain distance in this document. Now that I've scaled it, that value of 1 is going to be 4 times larger, and that's useful to be able to make these nice large things. When you do transform canvas, everything increases. So like the thickness, for example, of a line is going to increase. If I didn't do this, let me uh, just take off the transform canvas. This is very common, you'll see this is just a scale equal to 4. It's is almost the same as in it's, it's four times larger, the, the inherent stretching of the base canvas has still gone larger, but everything just looks a little bit thinner than it did before. And this is because when you do scale opposed to the transform scale, it's not just blowing up the entire image, including the thickness of everything. It's drawing things at the default thicknesses that we would have before. So I'm going to go back to transform canvas so that things look a little bit thicker. Okay, so now let's go through what's happening. First of all, I noticed that this arc here is not black, it is blue. And basically the way this works is you put in square brackets properties of the object that you want to impose. So for example, draw blue, that's creating this blue arc. Draw dashed, that's creating this dashed arc. If I wanted to do, for example, dashed and red, I could just put that in, uh, you know, a comma between them, and then it would go from dashed and black to dashed and red. 
You'll also notice that I'm drawing arcs, and the way I do that, by the way, is the same sort of idea. I put the center point in, then I write arc as opposed to circle. This tells me the degrees it's going from, from 90 to minus 90, and then because it's actually part of an ellipse, I have to give you the, the major and the minor, which I put at half centimeter, one centimeter. The next thing is how I've got this red filled in circle at the top and this red filled in circle at the bottom. So you'll notice down here I have these two lines that both involve circle, exactly as we saw them before. Circles with a very small radius. But what's different is that they're filled in. So what I've done here is instead of doing backslash draw, I've done backslash fill draw. And fill draw says it's going to draw the outside and fill it in. If you just do draw, it just does the outside. If you just do fill, it just does the inside. Fill draw does both of those. So I filled those in with red. And then the final thing here is you'll notice this background ball is not just gray, it's sort of like a nice shaded gray. And for that, I do backslash shade as opposed to backslash fill. Shade is going to have this sort of this nice little gradient that is going to be imposed on it. Other than that, it's just a circle with a center and a radius. But I have a bunch of different properties that I put in here for that, uh, for that shaded object. So in, in this case, uh, we've seen this notation before where you put two colors and then you put the percentage. So, so this is going to be 90% uh, white and 10% blue is sort of this mixture between it. So it ends up looking relatively gray in the end, but, but it actually got a slight bluish tinge to it. And then uh, if I had not added this opacity, this is actually a little bit of a hack that I did it this way. If I did not have the opacity there, it would have drawn on top of everything else. So you see how it would draw on top of it. And so I also added this opacity of basically 20%, but put it over top of everything. Could have been cleaner just to list it first without an opacity and then everything would go on top of that. But uh, either way, it's going to work out fine. I actually want to do a couple more properties. I'm going to go back to the very beginning here. Uh, notice how I have this draw. I want to show you how you can make it into an arrow. You literally just put in your square brackets a little miniature arrow. If I do this, then I'm going to have it appearing to be an arrow at the end. And I could adjust things like the, the size of the arrows if I so wished. Another thing I can do here is I'm going to copy paste another block of code that I've previously written on. This shows me how I can do a bunch of different line thicknesses. So it looks very complicated, but all I'm doing here is showing that I can, I can go into my draws, I've just done a bunch of different lines, and I can specify one of ultra thick, very thick, thick, thin, very thin, and ultra thin. So I often like to adjust the, the thicknesses of my objects in this way. So I've showed you a lot of these primitive objects, but I want to show you an incredibly powerful one now called a node. And you can think of a node as like a spot in the document where stuff can happen and that you can relate back to it. Maybe you want to put text there or maybe you want to put some sort of object. So I'll begin with the simplest, which is just putting text at a specific place. Like, let's go back to our one with our three circles. Maybe we've said, okay, at 0, 0, 2, 0, and 5, 0, I have something. Okay, so my syntax is I'm going to draw it again. I'm going to write a node and I write the node occurs at a spot like, well, I don't know, how about 3, 0. And then I'm going to put in squiggly brackets whatever the text that I want to display is. How about I do some mathematical text? I'll write f of x that's going to occur at this particular spot. I'm going to recompile and let's see what we get. So right here at that value of 3, 0, we get this f of x. And, and actually at this spot where you might start really preferring to use Tixi over just like any other image editor and then add your graphic in as an image, because if you were trying to do this in, I don't know, say PowerPoint, you're not going to have all of the capacities of latex to write mathematical equations in sort of the standard way embedded in there. So, so this is the real powerful part is that I can do all these circles and lines, which is admittedly more cumbersome than it probably is in a lot of other software, but you get that consistency of style and the full power of latex while you're doing it. And so this is what we're able to do. Let me copy and paste another command here that shows a, a little bit more of the power of drawing a node. This is going to be done in a little bit of a different way. So what I've done here is I've done a fill draw that fills in that circle. And I'm going to make a nice little filled in circle at the value of 6.2 and uh, with a radius of, of 0 0.1. doesn't matter. Now this is the interesting part. What I'm going to then do, so, so, so this part here is all something I might have seen before. But then I'm going to append to it a node. And notice what I've done here. I say node and it's anchor is to the west of it. So basically what we're imagining is that this circle is to the west of the node 
And then inside of the node in the squiggly brackets, I write anchored node because that, that's just what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to demonstrate an anchored node. So what do we have over here? We have that little bullet point appearing. That's what's created by this nice little circle with a radius of 0.1 centimeters. And, and this node has to its west the previous circle that was mentioned. So this is kind of a way that you can attach one item, this, this text, to some other thing that you've talked about. And I don't have to then change it. I don't have to always move the text around. So for example, if I go from 6-0, or 6-2 rather, to 6-0, so it's going to move it down, I don't have to redo the text. That text, because it's a node that is anchored to this particular circle, it just moves along with it. So very powerful way of doing it. But nodes are actually more powerful than even that. I'm going to go to the bottom and I'm going to copy paste some code that I've done before. Let's first just compile it and see what we're going to get. Okay, so this is the nice little diagram that I have. If you've seen my previous videos on the, the SIR model for pandemics, you will certainly recognize this diagram. But this is just a diagram I want to take. And what I notice about this is I have some various text and some, you know, mathematical symbols here. But I wanted to surround those texts in these nice colored boxes, have arrows going between them. That's what my objective is. And, and doing it with nodes is way easier than doing it with kind of the, the static rectangles and arrows that we've seen above. Let me show you what I mean. Okay, so, so this is the code that I've added to create this object. The, the first thing I notice is that this red box repeats itself three different times. And so I begin in the Tixi picture by specifying the style of something. So I'm going to create something referred to as SIR. This is called the SIR model of the, uh, uh, for pandemics. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to specify its style. And I'm going to put in here all the brackets about this. Okay, so what is it? It's a rectangle. So, so the idea is you have your node. And then whatever you put in your node, it's surrounded by a rectangle. This is what I mean by a style of it. It's different than drawing a rectangle. I'm saying the style of this node is a rectangle. The draw portion is the boundary, and I've set it to be very red. I specified it here to be 60% red and 40% and, and white. In contrast, the fill which goes inside, I've set it only to be 5% red and 95% and, uh, white. So this is why you get this sort of really nice dark boundary for the, for the draw and then this light for the fill. I've specified its thickness to be very thick. And then I've also done something kind of special here. I've said minimum size of five millimeters. The, the idea here would be if I put nothing in for, say, susceptible here, the smallest box that would be drawn would be a nice little rectangle, of, you know, with five millimeters along the outside edge. It, it's basically saying you have to have a, a minimum size to the node. Uh, anyways, so those are my styles. Okay, now look what I've done. I have created three nodes. Each of those nodes has as a parameter SIR. So I'm saying I'm drawing a node of the style, the SRI style, which is this thing with this fill and this draw and all of that. Then, it's quite interesting here, the next thing I do is I put it in round brackets. Susceptible, infectious, and recovered. Th these are not the words susceptible, infectious, and recovered. This is the name of the node. So it allows me to refer to that particular name coming up in the future. Okay, so then, so this, so the way I read this first line is I'm creating a node of the type SIR that is labeled susceptible and then over here in, squ in squiggly brackets I put what's actually displayed. Susceptible and then it with number signs S of T. So that's what's displayed here. Now I haven't put any location. I've just said spit it out at the default lo first location. But notice what happens for the second thing. It's almost exactly the same. Another node of type SIR, it's called infectious this time, and in the squiggly brackets, it's, it's got the new text display, infectious I of T. But I have here this section in square brackets, and I just say below is equal to of susceptible. And what this does is because it's a node, and nodes are all about relative placements here, it allows me to take the susceptible and below it is where it's going to draw the infectious. You could have also written to the right of it or anything else like this. Okay, then I'm going to add the third node, which is the recovered node. It's going to be below the infectious, and I spit it out here. If you want to, you can specify some of these distances between them, but, but this is just sort of the default. And what's nice is if I move things around, the relative position is going to be the same. Next up, in my diagram, I have these little arrows. I have to deal with them. So I've just done three arrows. They're just the same old drawing of, a, of, a, of an arrow that happens to be very thick that we've seen before. But instead of putting the two locations as like 1, 1, and 2, 2, say, 
The things I put in the round brackets for their locations, which is here and here, is in reference to my previous nodes. So this A arrow, which is to go from the south side of susceptible to the north side of infectious, this is how I do it. The first one is susceptible dot south. The north one is the infectious dot north. So I'm not putting like actual specified locations. I'm making everything relative, which allows me to adapt and tweak this diagram as many times as I want to. The final thing is it's not just an arrow. It's an arrow with an A beside it. And so the way I do this is just I stick in a node here that in between the, the one location and the other, I say that I want to make a node. It's to the right of the object that I'm talking about and it's going to be this, this number of A. Likewise for going from B, it's going from the south of infectious to the north of refectors. So there it is, infectious.south to recover.north and it, to its right, it writes B. Final thing, and this is kind of cool, I have this sort of twisted arrow here, kind of curvy arrow. You can make any Bezier curve that you so wish. Uh, a Bezier curve is like you draw a bunch of different points and it nicely smoothly tries to draw a curve in between those. And basically what you do is you specify the beginning and the end, but also control points in the middle that specify how sort of curvy it's going to be. So this is what I've done. I've started from the east side of recovered and going to the east side of susceptible. So from down here over to there, but I add these control points where I say, well, I want to go right seven millimeters up to, again, a right of seven millimeters. So it's kind of like these points that are sticking out here and it forces this curve that goes out this way. So if you ever need to tweak stuff, you tweak stuff with these control points. I'm going to go and show you a more complicated version that I've typed up, uh, very similar to what we just talked about here. Uh, let's go and give it some space. This is just a more complicated version of the model. For example, one property you might notice if you're talking about pandemics is that people split between older people and younger people and the different properties of the pandemic affect them in different ways. And so maybe I want to, to split this S of SIR model into an S young, I young, R young, and an S old, I old, and R old. <laughs> That's a, that came off the tongue weird. But nevertheless, it's just a more complicated diagram. Now, it's a big piece of code, but I want to illustrate just a couple things about this big piece of code. So the first is, I noticed that I have two different styles that I wanted to do. I've got these red boxes for the young people, these blue boxes for the old people. So where previously inside of the square brackets, I had just specified one different style, which I'd called SIR. Now I have a young node and an old node, and I specify those styles to be, well, similar, but the young ones have reds everywhere and the old ones have blue. So that's how I get these two different styles. And you'll see when I create the nodes down here, I have some nodes that are all have the style of old node, some which are going to have the style of a young node. Other than that, the basic ideas are the exact same. I specify names for all of these locations. I give their values, the things that are actually displayed inside of the square brackets. And then I just relatively refer to them left of sus old or below of sus old. It's just a, a sort of a reference to the locations of all of these different objects. I fill in all these different arrows and, and you can get a more complicated description like this. All right, that brings me to the end of this little introduction on Tixi. I want to be clear about just a few different points. First of all, I have only scratched the surface of what you were able to do with Tixi. There's a whole bunch more. In particular, in the next video, I want to show actual graphing. We're going to dive into the PGF plots a little bit more. So I want to show you how you can make all of your plots in terms of Tixi as well as, as well as sort of the more diagrams that we've been seeing in this video. Then I wanted to thank Overleaf one more time for sponsoring this video. Indeed, I think that working inside of Overleaf is incredibly nice. And I've only just scratched the surface on the, the, the nice features of Overleaf that we're uh, using. I've talked a lot about those features also in my previous videos on playlists. You can check those out. With that, we get to the end of the video. So do give it a like for the YouTube algorithm. If you have any thoughts or questions, leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.